When I first graduated from seminary, I had a great privilege in that I was asked to pastor a very uh, large and historic church in our circles, and uh, being just right out of seminary and having that opportunity uh, seemed like uh, a great privilege and played to my pride pretty well. And I think believing that I had all the gifts and skills for such an endeavor uh, was truly playing to my strengths and not understanding my weaknesses. I had no concept of how difficult pastoring a church would be, and particularly in that situation. Though this was an historic church, soon after I arrived, the standards for mining coal in the United States changed. And for our community, which was basically a mining farming area, that meant that the coal that had been mined for generations became illegal to use in this country. And within a matter of months, there were quite literally tens of thousands of people out of work in the communities surrounding our church. And not only were people out of work, but the mines were closing down not to open again. The farm economy was in the tank. Farms were being sold off, even those that had been in families for a century or more. And you can just imagine what happened, that uh, young people leave, income drops rapidly, pride and self-respect drop rapidly, and the consequence is that people will medicate any way they can. So at the very same time that income is dropping so rapidly and jobs are leaving the community, what's happening inside homes is that um, abuse is rising rapidly and divorce is rising rapidly, uh, addictions are rising rapidly, all the things that you would never want to happen as a pastor, but of course what's over the entire community that's smothering a lot of the evidence of that is depression. And that is just absolutely everywhere. And I thought I knew how to handle those things because I'd been to seminary. And uh, what that meant was I stood up in the pulpit every week and I said to people, stop it. Now just stop it. It says right here in the Bible that you shall not be drunk on much wine, so stop drinking the way you are. And it says here you shall love your wife as Christ loved the church. You may not hit her. I said stop it so often that I could not stand me anymore. And the consequence of that was I said at some point to my wife, I did not go to seminary to learn to hurt people, but I stand up in the pulpit every Sunday and I hurt people and I can't do this anymore. And we really did make that call to my wife's parents to say, we may be coming to live with you because I can't do this anymore. And the wonderful thing the Lord did in my life at that time was he brought to my awareness writings of a man named Sidney Gradanus, who was doing something that, as I look back, I think, why didn't I know that? But he was actually examining the lives of the heroes of the Bible with this question, how do you preach the heroes of the Bible? You know, there's David, he beat up the lion and the bear, and then Goliath, and if you just have enough faith, you can beat up the lions and the bears and the Goliaths in your life too. Uh, except that wasn't the message. Gradanus said, oh yeah, David had faith at that point in his life and he certainly beat up his enemies at that point, but you know, later on he slept with Bathsheba and murdered her husband and raised bad kids and at the end of his life numbered his troops as though he was responsible for his own glory. And not only did David, the great hero of the Bible, do that, virtually every other hero we can name in the Bible also has that kind of dirt in their record. And as Gradanus kind of slowly did that revisionist history of all the Sunday school material that I had been raised on and the heroes of the Bible, he made this very simple point. There's only one true hero of the Bible, and that's the Lord Jesus. Even those that we might not have some dirt on are only made strong by the work of God in them. And that message that Jesus is the only true hero and everybody else is in great need of the grace of God was revolutionary to my thinking that I could actually say to people in my church, if God could use people as messed up as those in the Bible to give hope, then maybe there's hope for you still too. That as messed up as your lives have been, as awful as they may be, God may still have a purpose for you. And for me, it wasn't just being able to say it to other people. It was hope to my own heart. I wasn't even out of my 20s and I believed I was a failure. And what God did by reminding me of the grace of the gospel was not only rescued my ministry, He rescued my heart. And everything I've done since has been trying to speak to people saying, if God could use people as broken and weak as I was, 
then he can use you too. And that's our hope.